Okay, well, good morning, everybody. We might as well get started. So in today's session, uh, well, in the morning, we're going to be looking uh, primarily at the sort of main subject of the course, which is, which is micro-injection moulding. Um, so uh, the structure of this talk um, is basically just an introduction to conventional injection moulding, just to give you the sort of basics of, of how injection moulding works, why it exists, what the, what the benefits are and advantages are of, of this particular process. And... Um, and then what we'll do is we'll introduce how micro-injection moulding machines differ slightly from these conventional pieces of equipment um, in order to, to kind of solve potential problems when using conventional injection moulding for micro-moulding type geometries. Um, we'll then look at some applications of micro-moulding techniques, so uh, areas where we're using micro-injection moulding uh, capabilities to make uh, very high accuracy structured surfaces, uh, achieve very, very uh, fine tolerances with different parts, and showing how we can use those in a range of markets uh, for, for functional devices. Uh, we're then going to look at what we're doing in terms of the materials in the micro-injection moulding process. So what's going on in terms of the way we're handling these materials and how we're structuring the internal morphology of materials to give us uh, certain uh, physical properties. And finally, I'll finish up by highlighting how we're addressing some of the questions raised by, by this area here with some of the research activities that we're doing in the micro-injection moulding laboratories, which also links closely with what you'll do later in the, uh, the hands-on workshops. So basically... Um, Injection moulding uh, technology, uh, basically uh, the majority of uh, polymer parts where you've got a fairly complex three-dimensional shape in thermoplastics will use injection moulding as a manufacturing process to, to manufacture these parts. Um, it's a net shape forming process, so basically it means you, you, um, you can output an object which is pretty much the final shape that you wanted at the start of the manufacturing process, there's no real finishing work required. Um, and basically you can achieve very, very uh, good quality, uh, very, very uh, high accuracy, and you can also make large volumes of, of parts using this kind of technique, which is why it's so common uh, throughout the world for making mass-produced goods. Um, if it w in order to, to form these parts, we're using fairly high forces and pressures, so an injection moulding piece of equipment tends to be a rather, a rather large machine to cope with these very, very high pressures and forces. It needs to be able to handle uh, high stress in the frame of the machine. Um, and, and as I said before, it, it's basically, the, the, its reason for existing is to make high volumes of parts at a comparatively low cost using thermoplastics. Um, historically, these were always hydraulic machines in order to deal with these very high forces that are required for doing this manufacturing process. But recently, since, uh, say, the mid-1990s, there's been a, a big shift towards servo-electric driven machines because they offer a, a much higher precision, almost like CNC, like uh, precision and control. Uh, and they also use less energy than, than the hydraulic machines as well for the majority of, of components. So, uh, so even though they cost a little bit more, there seems to be a general trend moving that way, particularly with the increased cost of energy. So we make a huge variety of, of different kind of components using the injection moulding technique. Some of the largest injection mould uh, tools in the world are used for, uh, for things like car panels, bumpers, uh, sometimes they're sort of like uh, crash impact zones, that kind of thing. Um, but then the, we, there's a the whole spectrum of device sizes in between from computers, TV surrounds, all, all sort of forms of plastic housings and that kind of thing, all the way down to the origins of, of micro-injection moulding for things like uh, uh, watch gears, so small plastic watch gears for companies like Swatch, that, that kind of thing. Um, so you can see that all of these have more complexity uh, than the things that uh, Dr. Kelly showed yesterday in the extrusion lecture. We're no longer looking at constant uh, 2D profiles. Um, we have these kind of uh, these 3D geometries that we can only form using a mold tool and using an injection molding process. <coughs> so some of the features of the, uh, of, of the process. Um, the cost profile is quite interesting. People always say, uh, I mean, additive manufacturing, 3D printing is, is becoming ever more popular. So in the future, perhaps everybody will use additive manufacturing techniques to, 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 to make components. Um, and whilst that's true to a certain extent for, for customized components, things where you want a specific shape for maybe just, uh, just a few samples or maybe up to a, a thousand samples, it still remains competitive. Um, and that's, that's mainly because um, uh, injection molding processes actually have quite a high initial equipment cost. So to make one part, you have to buy a molding machine which you can use for a range of components. But then you also have to invest on an injection mold tool. So basically the cavity that forms the shape of the part you want to manufacture. 
And due to the engineering required for those mold tools, the costs tend to be quite high. So ranging from uh, a few tens of thousands of pounds to millions of pounds in some cases for things like the automotive example that I showed earlier. So, so there's normally this fairly high capital equipment cost and, and the tooling cost. You've also got to have additional um, capabilities like material handling capabilities, drying capabilities, that kind of thing in your factory. Um, but, but the main thing here is the materials we're using are actually comparatively cheap. Adrian discussed the benefits of thermoplastics yesterday in the fact that they're easily formable, they have good mechanical properties, but overall the cost is pretty good. And we can make them extremely quickly as well. So even for the large parts, we generally have less than a minute cycle time for one of these machines to make each component. Um, for the smaller parts, that can come down to just a few seconds in many cases. You don't really have to look after the process. It's got a low labor cost because basically the machine will run in a fully automatic mode. You can integrate that with an automated system. And so what these all mean, that they, even though you've got this initial high investment cost, the marginal cost, so the cost to make one more component, is actually pretty low. So basically, if you're making really high volumes of something, you've got quite a high initial profile, but then the cost profile flattens out significantly, and you can start to make some significant profits. And so that's, why, uh, that's kind of why injection molding is best used for, for very high volume, uh, volume manufacture. So let's have a quick look at, at how the process works. This is uh, an animation supplied by uh, Engel, who are a company who make injection molding machines. Uh, they do have a, a nice, a nice uh, funky soundtrack to go to it, but it's, uh, it's going to get in the way of my talking. So basically, the machine is, is split into, into two uh, individual areas, basically. You've got the material, uh, sort of plastic melt preparation side, which is this side here, which is going to do the melting of the material. And then here we've got the mold side. So this is clamping the mold together where our mold sits in there and also has things like the ejector pins that, that pop the part out of the mold. So, so if we look, uh, first of all, at the, uh, at the injection side of this, this is very similar to the extrusion process that, that Dr. Keller discussed yesterday. So inside this heated barrel here, uh, we have uh, basically an extruder screw uh, that, that's operating the exact same way as, as Adrian discussed yesterday. So we have basically a feed zone, a compression zone, uh, in order to, 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 to basically convey and then melt the material. Uh, we also have a, a chilled area here as well to stop any problems with, with pellets. Um, with pellets spilling around the screw and not feeding forward, as, as was discussed yesterday. The main difference is, at the end of this screw, we have a small valve. We basically uh, have a check ring, because the screw is now no longer fixed. The screw actually moves backwards and forwards, which gives us our injection stroke to force material into the cavity. So basically, the screw only turns as it, as it moves backwards in order to convey material through into this melt reservoir here. And then what happens is the screw moves forward and this valve closes, and that's able to, to force the material into the cavity. So it's a little bit more complex than, uh, than the standard extrusion process alone. But basically it's this injection action, this forcing forward as, as a ram of, of the screw that actually forces the material through our nozzle and into our cavity form here, which makes the shape of our, of our component, okay? So as you can see here, the actual screw geometry is pretty similar to the conventional injection molding process. So this side of the machine is all at the melt temperature of the material, which can be anywhere between 200 degrees and 450 degrees. The mold side is much lower than that. So typically mold temperatures range between about 40 degrees and maybe up to 200 for some of the high temperature polymers. So this is it's, it's cooling in this region here and solidifying, which forms our, which forms our final part. So that's, that's the basic overview of, of how the process works. So if we look at those individual stages in the process, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got two basic steps. So we've got the melt generation and the production by the rotating screw. We've then got the, this forward motion of the screw that actually forces the material into the cavity to form the, the, the shape of our part. And so what we can do is we can break up uh, the, the, this, this filling phase or, or this, this, this cavity filling phase um, into, into a number of, 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 of key parts of the, uh, of the uh, injection molding cycle. So basically, the first part of the process uh, is, is, is the filling stage. So we're injecting the melt into the mold cavity. So that's the first movement of the screw. But then what happens is, as it's doing that, the screw is moving at a constant velocity. That's the setting on the machine. We tell the screw how fast to move, because that's going to influence the shear rates that we're having, and basically the, the speed it takes to fill the cavity. But if we stayed in that constant velocity control and we filled the mold cavity, we would get a sudden increase in pressure because the material has nowhere to flow anymore and so there'll be a big spike in pressure and that can in some cases cause damage to the tool. So what we actually do is we part fill the cavity to about 99% full 
And then we switch over the control of our screw from a, uh, a velocity controlled regime to a pressure controlled regime, okay? So now we can no longer see these pressure spikes. We can impose a, a pressure limit on, on the filling phase of the, uh, of, of the process. Um, and so what we do is, is we then sustain that pressure um, for, for a given period of time. So basically, what we do is we, we fill the cavity under a pressure control and we hold that pressure on there for, for quite a few seconds in many cases. And what that is doing is that's countering the fact that as the material is cooling and solidifying, its volume changes. Basically, it becomes more dense. And so what it's effectively doing is shrinking inside the mold cavity. So by sustaining that pressure after the part is filled, we're able to squeeze in a little bit more material to fill that volume that's left by, by the part actually solidifying, okay? So imagine it's cooling from, from the contact with the, with the mold surface, so you've effectively got a kind of sandwich structure of a frozen layer on the outside of the part and a soft molten core. So by continuing to keep that core under pressure, we can take into account some of the, some of the shrinkage uh, behavior in the, uh, in the material. Um, and what I can do is you can actually see, I'll, I'll, I'll show, I'll pass around a very simple injection molding part, it's a test specimen here, but you can see this is the sprue, that, so the nozzle tip will, will end here, this is the sprue that takes it into the mold. Uh, the mold splits down the split plane here, and you might have to see things like little circles on the back of the part uh, that basically are, uh, indicate the location of the ejector pins. So we have a set, an array of pins that actually pushes the part out of the mold once the cycle is complete, so it's an effective way of removing it. But if you look on the back of the part here, where we have this rib junction, and another th thicker section here, you will actually see a slight, um, a, a slight sort of indented area in the back of the tool, which is caused by this shrinkage process, okay? So it's, a, it's quite a nice visual indicator of what's going on. <coughs> so they're the two main parts of the process. Um, what's going to happen, though, is after a certain amount of time, one of the smaller sections on the part is the gate, so the bit where the polymer enters the cavity, and that's going to freeze fairly early in the process. And once that's frozen, it doesn't really matter what you're applying in terms of pressure, because if you can't continue to fill the part, then you're not really doing anything with your whole pressure. So we stop that whole pressure there, and then we just have an additional time period for cooling. So basically, we're no longer applying pressure to the cavity, but we've got to wait for the part to cool sufficiently that we can eject it without permanently deforming it, okay? So we have to wait until it's, uh, uh, we're well below the heat deflection temperature. And once that's done, basically then we're just concentrating on preparing the next shot, so the screw will go back again. Uh, we decompress it, so we take a little bit of pressure off that screw as it screws back to avoid material sort of leaking out of the nozzle uh, into the next shot. And then we open the mold and remove the part. But they're the, they're the, basic, uh, <laughs> the basic parts of the process. So I mentioned the screw before. The screw is very similar uh, in design to the ones that Adrian discussed yesterday. And likewise, we can also choose different screws depending on what, what materials we're using. So generally, this compression zone here can have different compression ratios for, for different materials. Uh, but the important bit is this check ring that, that opens and closes at the end. So basically, we have this ring of material around this end of the screw. So as soon as we start to push the screw forward to act as a ram, then basically the friction on this ring here it means it's forced back to seal against this surface here. And once that seal occurs, there's no way the material can actually be, uh, be, be forced back over the screw. So it makes sure you get a really good positive displacement of injection into the cavity. The problem is for micro-injection molding is if, the, if you're trying to inject with really, really high precision, the movement of this ring backwards um, gives you a bit of a lack of control of the volume of material just in this area here. And that volume in many cases can be the size of, 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 of a considerable number of parts that you're trying to manufacture in micro-injection molding. So it kind of introduces a slight unknown in terms of your dosing capability and your injection capability. Um, if we look at a typical uh, pressure profile going through the cavity, this is what I was saying before. So we have this initial fill level. So basically the gradient of the curve in this fill region is an artifact of the geometry of the cavity. We can actually see different increases in the filling pressure here, and we can relate that to different sections in the cavity. So basically, if you have a very thick section, you're gonna have a fairly shallow pressure gradient here to fill that. If you, go, if you have a, a fairly thin wall component or a narrow section, then you're going to need quite a high pressure gradient to get the flow of material to, to go down there. Um, so this here is the important bit. This is the bit I was talking about before where we switch over. So about 99% filled. We switch over from the velocity control to the pressure control, and then we sustain that pressure in the cavity to take into account the shrinkage. And once that gate has frozen, we're not doing any more, then basically we're in the cooling stage and the pressure will start to drop off to zero. Um, and then we, we, can, we can eject the part. <coughs> so, so this shrinkage uh, is, is an issue, and basically what we want to do is we want to minimize the effect of, uh, of shrinkage on our components. And so that's why the majority of injection molded parts that you see will tend to have 
uh, some fairly thin walled, uh, fairly thin walled rib like structures to, to give them the, the sort of mechanical strength that they need. We want to avoid thick sections because thick sections are going to cause problems because they're difficult to pack during this, this whole stage of the process. So I'll pass one round one here. You've got a nice example of a kind of rib structure here to build strength. This is also interesting as well, though, because it's a water-assisted ejection molding component where water has actually also been used to hollow out this main thick section here. And this is actually the uh, clutch pedal from a BMW i8. So it's a carbon fiber filled, uh, filled plastic component that's made using, using these kinds of processes. But the, the important thing here is we need to avoid these thick wall sections because they're going to cause problems with shrinkage. Uh, and we also want to avoid long flow paths because that's going to require higher injection pressures to actually, uh, actually fill the cavity. <coughs> so here's an example of how, how wall thickness uh, problems can manifest themselves. Basically, we already have thick sections here. We can actually start to see sink marks, as you'll see on the first component that's coming around. So basically, as the part cools, we've got this, this kind of reservoir melt in the, in the, in the central section of this rib. Uh, and basically, if we're unable to pack that, because once again, I say if, if this plaque area here freezes first, then the material will be kind of drawn in by that material that's, sinking, uh, that, that, that's shrinking uh, to give us this kind of uh, defect here, which is very, very common on the majority of injection molded parts. Uh, even worse is what can happen if, if it adheres to the mold surface here, you can get internal voids occurring as well. So the material shrinks, which is causing this internal voids, which you can't actually see with the naked eye, but you've got a weakness inside your part. So it can, be, it can cause real problems. So what we could, would tend to do here is you can actually apply a rib on the mold surface, which actually keeps the, uh, the thickness uh, very similar. So basically the shrinkage will be taken account of all at the same time. So we can, we can core out these, thick, the, these uh, thick sections. <laughs> Another very effective way of uh, keeping the strength of a component while keeping the wall thickness uh, uniform is just to use ribs as well. So in the example we have here, basically by using arrays of rib sections here, we're using the second moment advantage to increase the stiffness of the component, but we're using less material and we're using thinner sections, so it's going to, it's going to have benefits that we don't have any, any uh, shrinkage. But also another one is we're keeping the cycle time uh, as low as possible as well, because most of the time spent in the tool is waiting for it to cool. If we have these thin wall sections, then basically um, that's going to cool much quicker, reduce our cycle time, which means we can make more components per day, which is a, which is a good idea for molding. Um, another thing we have to consider is getting the part out of the mold once it's been, uh, once it's been made. Uh, because this shrinkage is occurring, if you imagine you've got like a cylindrical boss in the tool, it can shrink onto that cylinder and it can be sometimes quite difficult to release it. So what we tend to do in our mold designs is we'll apply at least one degree, sometimes more, of draft to each of these, uh, each of these walls in our mold. So basically, if we have an undrafted component like this, uh, we risk uh, having trouble ejecting the part. Sometimes the force is required for the ejector pins to push the, uh, push the part out of the tool, so we maybe be pushing on this edge here can be enough to damage the part. We can cause cracking behavior um, as, uh, during ejection, which is a problem. However, if we put a nice draft angle on something like this, then obviously as we push on the top here, it easily gives way and it comes out of the mold okay. So this is something we have to consider. And this is all done in the mold design sort of stage of the process, basically. What we will do is we will, we will look at the material we're using. We'll be able to, from the manufacturer's data sheets, we can, uh, we can estimate what the shrinkage is going to be for that particular material. And then we effectively just make the tool bigger to compensate for the shrinkage. If we know the material is going to shrink by, say, 2%, we can make the whole tool 2% larger in each dimension, and then we'll get a part that comes out uh, at the required, uh, the required dimension. So during that tool design process, um, we can't really change it. We, we, we de we've designed the component at this stage to make sure it's suitable for the injection molding process, but then we still have to think about things like where we inject uh, the material from on that, on that part design. So gate location. Uh, can be quite challenging to do because what we want to do is make sure we get a nice kind of uniform pressure distribution throughout the part but we want to avoid key problems like things like weld lines so basically wherever we get two flow fronts coming together we're going to get um, basically the, the, the coldest part of the material coming into the cavity is actually at this, uh, this flow front here so that cold material is going to not knit as well when it, when it impinges on itself, basically. So we have a problem that wherever we're flowing around bosses to make holes in our part, we've got these two flow fronts come together and we form these weld lines or knit lines that you can clearly see on many components. And they're a source of weakness. Basically, the, the molecular chains, the, the, the molecules in that region, aren't, uh, aren't uh, completely uh, sort of diffusing with each other, basically. We have a, we have a boundary there which can cause uh, stress concentrations and, and they can guide fractures. 
So in many cases, we can't avoid these because if we have a hole in our part, there's, there's no injection location on this part that we can choose that won't cause a weld line. But what we can do is maybe look at the FE modeling and make sure that these weld lines don't fall on really highly stressed parts or areas of the, of the product, okay? <coughs> we also have to look at the size of the gate and the gate location to avoid problems like this, which is a jetting behavior. So rather than a nice uniform filling pattern that we see on the top part here, uh, particularly for fiber filled materials, we can see this kind of snaking behavior. So the material will snake into the cavity. Um, so effectively now you've got a whole mass of weld lines all inside your part. So you have real problems with surface quality because you'll be able to see these kind of flow marks on the surface of your product. And also the, the mechanical performance will never be as good because we're not getting the benefits of a nice shearing flow, which is causing orientation of your, your molecules and your alignment. We've got this much more random distribution with internal weaknesses as well. So these are things we have to consider. <coughs> so as I say, on most components, uh, you can see where these weld lines occur and you can see that they'll, they'll exhibit themselves on the surface of the part and they'll also cause stress concentrations as well. So if you don't control your weld lines adequately, you're creating local, uh, local failure, uh, failure regions in your, in your component. So, so that's, that's a, 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 sort of a, a brief overview of the conventional injection molding process. The machine we're gonna be using today is the Wittmann Bettenfeld MicroPower 15, which has made a few modifications to sort of standard conventional injection molding to overcome some of these problems. So first of all, uh, with, with making these smaller components, what we want to do is reduce the amount of material we're having to use to make each shot. So in the first part that came around there, we've got quite a long sprue on there, which is quite a high volume of material. So what we've done with, uh, well, what Wittmann and Battenfeld have done with their machine design is we still have a fixed, uh, a fixed screw here, but basically we've done away with the check ring. So we no longer have that check ring there, which is causing this problem with this unknown amount of material that, that, that could be conveyed uh, in that check ring. Um, so this screw still maybe moves backwards and forwards to dispense material, but by not having this check ring in here, we're, we're able to, uh, to deposit uh, uh, slightly, slightly more, more accurately. Um, but then what we do for the injection phase of the process, I mean, this, because this screw doesn't have a check ring on there, we can't use really, really high pressures because obviously the polymer will just be forced back over the screw because we don't have this valve type system. So what we do is we use the movement of this screw forward uh, uh, at a fairly low pressure to actually just convey material into this injection piston here. And this injection piston is then moving forwards, I'll just play that again, and taking material uh, into the cavity at very, very high speed, but also in a very, very well controlled manner. Because the problem is, in many cases, we're filling this cavity in milliseconds, like a single millisecond in some cases. So this piston is actually having to bring material in here. It's having to switch over incredibly quickly when that part is almost full and then switch to this hold pressure. And if you actually look at the requirements for the, for the controller of this, uh, of this injection unit, they're really, really demanding. But basically the benefits are good uh, because basically all our material is going into the cavity. So we don't leave any sort of melt left in the screw. Unlike conventional injection molding where we have this melt cushion material. Um, which is going to then go into the, the next shot, basically. With this one, the, the entire shot is uh, distributed into the cavity. We don't have any sprue material, so we're minimizing the amount of material that we need to use. And we've got a nice separation between the cold mold and the hot material preparation area as well. In a conventional injection molding machine, you've got this constant contact between the hot nozzle and the cold mold, so you've got a bit of a pressure gradient in there. So the first shot of your next cycle uh, will or the first part of that shot will actually be a little bit cooler than the rest of the material behind it, and that can cause problems with, with, with micro-injection molding. And the last thing is, in micro-molding, we're not really waiting for things to cool. These things cool in fractions of a second. So, so a, a huge part of the cycle time in conventional injection molding is kind of irrelevant for micro-molding. So we can actually increase our production outputs by having two tools mounted on the same machine, which allows us to remove the part from one tool and inspect it or, or assemble it, as we're molding the next part. So we effectively get a, a reduction of the cycle time of about, uh, about half by having this two tool system in there. <coughs> okay, so uh, once we have these technologies, we can use them for a range of, a range of application areas. So I've separated them into, into a few different ones here. Um, the first one is uh, sort of engineering components. So these are components used for their sort of mechanical property behavior. Uh, in this case, it's kind of actually a sort of thermal behavior because we're using a highly nanotube filled, uh, filled material. But these we're looking at sort of structures and strength uh, and, and also um, very accurate sort of dimensional control. So a nice example here is a part which is a peak, um, a peak bobbin. 
uh, with uh, which requires uh, tolerances of just under sort of 10 microns for the uh, for the uh, the gaps between uh, each of these fins. And what this acts is as a bobbin for um, creating an inductive sensor. So basically, a copper wire is wound around this bobbin. So we have to make sure we have no uh, sort of uh, stress concentrators, split lines, or, or edges on here that could break that copper wire. Um, but that's a nice example. And it's an inductive sensor used for measuring the coating thickness uh, of electroplating, basically. Um, but other examples, we've got mechanical components. I mentioned sort of things like watch gears earlier in polymers. And we can also use different materials like metal and ceramic powder. So this is from a collaborator over at uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, where they're working with, uh, with ceramic filled powders. We've also done some of this work at Bradford as well. So effectively, we're using injection molding, to to, uh, uh, but we fill the tool with ceramic powder and a polymer binder. We can then uh, put them in a furnace. We remove the polymer binder to create like a ceramic scaffold. And then we can sinter that component to make a final almost uh, well, sort of 98% uh, solid uh, ceramic part as well. So it gives us the capability to use different materials for different applications. <coughs> Another big area is, is optics. We can work closely with sort of uh, people who produce very high quality tools using diamond machining techniques so they can directly machine optical surfaces. Well, when we get those parts, we can then replicate those optical surfaces in a range of polymers using a, a sort of micro-injection molding process. We have these very, very high pressures with our, with our injection piston which allows us to get very good replication quality of these kind of structural elements. So we do this as an anti-reflective light harvesting device for photovoltaic applications. So basically we can, uh, we can increase the efficiency of solar cells rather than having sun tracking systems by having some clever uh, sort of polymer, uh, polymer collectors mounted to the, the active element. So we've, got to, we've done a, a range of work in this area. Uh, another one is dentistry, surprisingly. We've done a fair bit of work with, uh, with different uh, dental applications. This is one of those, which is the core for root canal treatment that goes down the nerve of your tooth, if you were unlucky enough to have had uh, root canal treatment. Um, and, uh, and basically, this, this involved a lots of development work on getting the material right. So it's a two-component nylon, heavily filled with a zirconi material. So we had to look at how the material flowed, how we could ensure that the process was going to be, be a success. Um, and, uh, and then this is, this is taken away and a coating is applied to this, to this, uh, this core. So when it goes into a root cavity, it, uh, it actually absorbs a little bit of moisture in the area, swells slightly, uh, and, and avoids the, uh, the chance of reinfection. So this was something developed at the university, uh, which is now out there in industry and, and, and is being used uh, to the tune of probably about a million components so far. So it's, uh, it's been quite a good success. It also offers significant benefits over the current technology too. <coughs> um, Another example, I used to show the video for this, but I have to be a bit careful because people start to feel a bit faint and, and ill, but we do uh, medical devices too. So the scale of this, I'll show you in the labs later. I mean, the capsule itself is about this long, so it's not a kind of true micromolding component, but in here we have some, some detail. We've got a, an internal surface finish and a, and a profile, which is designed to handle very, very thin uh, materials from, from, from the human eye. So basically there's a certain type of cataract that affects the back of your, of your lens in your eye. And, uh, and for that to be treated, the surgeon has to basically go into the, into the eyeball itself and he scrapes that material away that's gone, gone opaque and cloudy. But he needs to replace that with something, so he'll take the same material from an eye that's been donated by, by a cadaver, but this material is only about 50 microns thick, so it's like a piece of, a tiny circle of cling film, which he needs to then get back into the eye again. So we worked with a company to develop this technology, which is uses this, this capsule here, and basically what happens is uh, we place this tiny thin uh, sort of endothelium and this, uh, this part of the component. We use forceps coming through the part to draw that into this capsule here. And the detail inside this capsule automatically rolls this, this tiny thin bit of material up to make it more compact. But of course it has to do that without tearing or, 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 or shearing the component in any way. Then this is taken, it goes into the eyeball itself and another forceps is used to remove the component in the eye and it automatically unfolds. You can put a bubble of air behind that and that will graft to the site and give a really, really good outcome compared to the alternative, which is full cornea replacement surgery where you basically use a hole punch to punch out the eye from, from a donor and then put it straight into the, uh, into the patient here. So it's much, much less uh, uh, intrusive and gives much better outcomes over time. But obviously, it poses real manufacturing issues because we have to make sure there's no contaminants in here. And also, we have to avoid any kind of flash or bits of material that might be hanging off the edge of this component because if they break away in the eye, they'll be there for the rest of the patient's life. So there's some, some significant challenges to be looked at. <coughs> We've also looked at things like reel-to-reel uh, -reel processes. 
So this is an interesting variant of the micromolding process where we pass a filament through the mold and we can mold uh, any kind of structures onto that filament. So in this case, these are kind of almost spherical beads. So we pass the filament through, we're molding four at a time, and then we can create these kinds of, these kinds of objects as well. So more kind of chain objects in, inside the process. Once again, it requires um, a quite a lot of, uh, of, of care in doing this. So we needed to measure the tension we're putting on the filament, measure the Poisson's ratio, so we can measure the actual diameter of the filament, and that allows us to cut our mold tool so it's a perfect fit, and we don't have any problems with flashing down the string from, from bead to bead. <coughs> We do lots of work in looking at functionalized surfaces as well. So we might be looking at larger parts, but using micromolding techniques to replicate micro nano features on these kinds of surfaces. So we can have structures down from a few hundred nanometers in this case to a few microns for a whole, whole range of applications. We've looked at antimicrobial, we've looked at cell culturing applications, and we're also looking at things like bearing applications as well, tribological applications such as friction reduction and, uh, and also things like uh, acoustic behavior of materials as well, so anti-squeak properties and that kind of thing. <coughs> uh, another example is uh, we can also incorporate um, these micro and nanoscale details for anti-counterfeit activities as well. So this is a, a project working on at the moment. Uh, this was some early work looking at QR code. So here we have a laser machines QR code pattern, but then within a single pixel of this, we've repeated the pattern again using a uh, focused ion beam milling in the mold tool. Uh, so, so the features here, this is about uh, two millimeters in terms of the side length, whereas down here, um, each one of these pixels uh, is around about uh, just over a micron in side length, and the, the depth of that is about 500 nanometers. So we've got a kind of micro scale and nano scale pattern to, to threat parts. And once again, it's, quite, it's got a quite nice profile for anti-counterfeiting because although the tool insert is quite expensive initially, uh, after that there's no marginal cost. So you're not paying for dyes or RFID tags or that kind of thing down the line. And it's also a nice process quality indicator as well because if you had a low quality counterfeiting process, you wouldn't be able to replicate this feature anyway. So basically you'd be able to tell that from the, uh, from the parts if someone did manage to copy your mold insert. So with all these applications, um, what are we actually trying to achieve? We've got all these different demands from our customers, and basically their wishes could be, uh, obviously the one of the most important ones is form, ultra-precision accuracy with the dimensions that, of, that, that we've been given by the customer. But then with that come, come all sorts of other requests as well. It's got to obviously have the right mechanical properties because it can't break in use. We might be working with optical materials, in which case transparency and biorefringence become important. And there's a whole range of others as well. So electrical, thermal, uh, for the pharmaceutical applications, it could be API solubility or, or, or sort of antimicrobial behavior. We might want to have some kind of, a, some kind of behavior there as well. So we've got all these demands on us for our different materials. And so it sometimes becomes quite difficult to, 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 to understand or, 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 or be confident that we've got the optimum process conditions to get the best out of these materials. So if we actually look at the problem that we're faced with, we've got, um, we've got our input materials here, which all have, all have different properties. They flow in different ways. They will crystallize in different ways. We might have amorphous materials which don't, don't crystallize at all. Uh, they get different surface energy effects, different thermal behavior. And so... What we, what we do here in this lab is we make sure that we can characterize each, each phase of the manufacturing process. So we understand from a material starting point what we're doing to them all the way through this manufacturing process. So then we can start to be able to predict what we would expect the final outcomes to be in terms of, in terms of the performance of our components. And that's basically the structure for, the, for this whole workshop. I mean, we've already looked at the extrusion. Today we're talking about injection molding. What we're going to do is look at how important these things are. So this afternoon, we'll talk about the rheology of the materials, so the flow behavior of these materials and how that's relevant for this process. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll talk about morphology development, so how they crystallize and how those results in the, in, the, uh, in the final properties. And then on Friday, we'll actually look at measuring those properties and relating them to what we've learned here. But what I want to, what I want to focus on in, in this talk is basically um, how we understand what we're doing to the materials in the microinjection molding process. So how can we take measurements to be able to characterize the environment that we're exposing these materials to, so that understanding how these materials behave, we can start to be able to predict these final properties. And this is, this is basically our, our kind of uh, unique, uh, our, our sort of unique selling point in, in, in this department, this research department at Bradford. We don't do tooling, we, don't, mm, we do some process development, but we don't make uh, manufacturing hardware. But what we do do is generate understanding of how these very, very complicated materials, these long chain molecules behave in given environments 
so we can start to predict what the outcomes are going to be for our micromolded components. So I'm going to look at some research areas that deal with this kind of measurement capability. How, how we, do we interrogate the process to understand what we're doing? How can we use that to troubleshoot processes and make fundamentally better components? So the first area is, is the sort of sensor technologies. So these are some of the systems we're using in the labs and some things that you will use uh, later on this morning in order to understand what's happening in this process. So, so this is, uh, this is our, our micro-injection molding machine. And just to give an example of the kind of uh, the extra sort of measurement capabilities we install on this machine, I've got some examples in the slides here. So one of the first things we, we did when we got this machine was we wanted to understand the injection kinetics of the machine. So we actually installed a laser displacement sensor on the rear of the injection piston inside the injection unit. So here we've got a laser triangulation sensor. We've got a target mounted on the back of our injection piston. So the piston is actually attached to this, this piece of metal here. And that gives us a, um, a, a very fast, about sort of 3,000 measurements per second way of measuring the position and the velocity of, of this injection piston with time. Now, you may wonder why we have to do that, because we've actually got an encoder on the main servo drive that drives that injection piston. But the problem is, the encoder is mounted uh, sort of down here, some on the main drive unit, but then we've got this belt system that's actually transferring that motion to the injection piston to give us the injection. So we've got this disconnect between where we could measure from and what the piston is actually doing. And when we actually compare the outcomes of those two measurements, we do see this slight deviation here, which is of the order of uh, 300 microns, which doesn't sound like a lot from a machine perspective, but when you equate that to an actual volume of material, it can be the entire molded part, an error between what your machine is telling you and what we're actually measuring off the system. Now we can correct for it, it's not a big issue, we've just got a kind of hooky and uh, sort of spring response of, of the belt on, on the machine there, and basically with increased pressures, we see this, this, uh, this differential increases because we've got this kind of elastic behavior in the system. Um, but, but this kind of measurement allows us to implement those changes. We can modify our results to, to, so we understand exactly where uh, the, the, the flow was at a given point in time. We actually can collect all this information over ethernet. So we've got a, a, a national instruments box in the side of this machine, which takes this data alongside uh, injection pressure data, uh, thermal data, and, and a range of other things. So we can capture that on a per cycle basis, or we can monitor a run over, over a length of time as well. So these are the kind of data sets that we get. <coughs> Once again, one of the advantages of having a separate data acquisition system is it allows us to make measurements much more quickly. So we're sampling much faster than the machine could sample in this case. Um, so it, we can see these very, very fast responses. I mean, you can see here, everything is happening in, in, a, in a fraction of a second for the micro-injection molded part. So this is the filling profile here. So basically that's happening in uh, in just, a few, in just a few milliseconds, this is for a reasonably large component. But uh, we can generate all this kind of data and we can start to see when things are occurring. So we've got uh, injection pressure, we've got infrared temperatures, uh, all these things we can, we can use to be able to quantify what's happening in the cavity. Uh, and it's also very useful for benchmarking simulation software as well. <coughs> so that's all well and good. We've got these individual point measurements inside, inside, the inside the cavity, so we can start to get an understanding of what's happening with the environment. But we've also spent time developing is actual visualizing what's happening in the mold tool. Why just have one measurement when you've effectively got uh, a sensor array and a camera that you can use to, to actually image directly what's going on in the cavity? So we spent some time over the last 10 years developing our, our imaging capability for these kinds of processes. Now the problem is, these things can fill in less than a millisecond in some cases, so we need very, very high speed acquisition in order to, in order to get the data out for, for, for these kinds of processes. So, so we're generally dealing with very high speed camera technologies. This is the camera we have in the, in the labs at the moment, which basically will record about 5,000 frames a second at full HD resolution, but we can actually reduce the window size as well, so we can take fewer pixels and we get a linear increase in, in the rates. So we can actually sample all the way up to a million frames a second if we want to. Uh, we're dealing with less than a microsecond exposure times, so we get really nice sort of crisp images. We do need a fair bit of light in order to achieve those. Um, but it can write, also write an awful lot of data, so it's about 64 gigabytes of data in two seconds. So data management becomes, becomes a bit of an issue with this. But once we have this, it gives us a unique capability for, for looking at processes uh, and understanding them in, 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 in a different light. So a nice example here is I discussed weld lines before. Weld lines are a problem in conventional injection molding. They're a huge problem in micro-injection molding. Because everything's cooling so much quicker, you have even greater weaknesses with a, with a weld line in a micro-molded part 
because they don't have time to knit together. Everything's happening too quickly uh, and, and it's cooling much more rapidly. So we actually used a system here to measure the kind of velocity that these, that these flow fronts come together and from that we can, we can calculate the influence on, on weld line strength. So this is the, the, the mold design we use for this. It's actually a very simple design. We have our two cavity plates that form the cavity here and here and we just have a, a sapphire window that forms the window in those cavity plates and a 45 degree mirror behind that allows us to view from the side using, using the camera um, directly. So it's a, it's a fairly straightforward system but it works and it's less to go wrong basically. Um, <coughs> so, so with a visible camera we would actually illuminate the cavity through the lens so we would have a, a, an optical path that comes from a source here and through the lens reflects off the mirror into the cavity which is formed on this side of this sapphire window and then back again but we can also use a high speed infrared capability as well so basically we can, we can view the surface of the component and measure cooling profiles using our infrared camera as well so so now basically our, our part is the infrared emitter we can measure that infrared measure the intensity of that and we can start to plot uh, cooling profiles for, for the part so first of all uh, some examples of of the high speed visible camera now it, 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 they, these, these slow motions can look a, a bit dull. So for reference, what I've done is I've shown it alongside, uh, this is a tattoo needle. Anyone got a tattoo? So this is, a, this is basically a five point tattoo needle oscillating at 100 hertz and that's recorded at 7,500 frames a second. And then below it, we've got our tensile test bar cavity filling, which is being recorded four times faster than a tattoo needle. So it gives you an idea of how fast this process is happening. There it looks very, very slow and controlled, but actually this filling is happening in, in much less than, than a millisecond, okay? But having this, this high-speed capability allows us to, to record that with really good resolution. So we can plot the, the position of that flow front, we can calculate our actual, um, um, our actual flow rates into the cavity. So once again, if we're doing comparisons with simulation software, we know exactly what's happened that's generated our data. So it's a very, very powerful, powerful technique. We can also do it with the infrared cameras as well. So these were some initial results for, the, for this black disc, which is, uh, which is uh, on, the, uh, on the injection molding machine. And what we can do is we can plot it at different temperatures and we can call different, uh, different phenomena happening in that. The interesting thing here is we always see this, this, this hot area right behind the flow front. And that's exactly what we expect to see um, because uh, of, of, of the fountain flow effect. So basically I'll, I'll, I'll come on to show that in, uh, in, in a couple of slides. Um, so, so, so we've got the capability to, to measure all these different things. So how do we apply these to measure something that's crucial for micro-injection molding? Now, I've said already that things tend to get a little bit di more difficult as we get to, uh, to smaller and smaller components. And one of the main reasons for that is as you reduce the size of the part, uh, its surface area to volume ratio increases significantly. So what that means is in a micro-scale mold, um, more of the material is in the near wall region. So the interface between the melt and the steel or that wall becomes hugely significant, okay? So basically, uh, most, of the, most of the material is, is in that near wall region, so cooling rates are much higher than conventional injection molding, but also the heat transfer across that boundary is gonna be hugely significant on the overall cooling of the material, the chance for structures to develop, the morphology, and the resulting physical properties. So this interface, this, this kind of melt steel interface, becomes very, very significant. So we've done some work to look at what, what is the impact of this uh, and, and, and how influential is it. So, so this comes from um, basically looking at what, what, what causes, what affects the heat flow across this boundary. So if you look at a, 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 basic, a tool surface <coughs> in, in CAD land, it's basically a perfect sort of planar interface normally. So if you do your SOLIDWORKS model and you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, it's always just going to look like this. But in the real world, obviously, there's always going to be these microscale features on, on any tool surface with, within reason. We can get some very, very flat surfaces. But if you look closely, basically what you have is basically a, a sort of rough area here at the interface. So you're going to have um, the, the, the heat flow across this boundary is going to be dominated by the overall contact area between the polymer and the steel, which is effectively linked to the length of, 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 of this line here. But also it's going to be affected by the pressure that's forcing the polymer into all these little nooks and crannies. And of course the viscosity of the material because its ability to conform or, or deform to, 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 to take this shape. But then we might also have air trapped in some of these deeper pockets as well. So we've got, we've got another material in there that's going to influence this heat transfer across the boundary. 
So all of these contribute to what's called this heat transfer coefficient, which is the ability for heat to cross this boundary between the melt and the polymer. And this is, uh, this is the important value. I mean, uh, there's a range of simulation software out there. This is Autodesk MoFlow. And they use these, these, uh, these fixed parameters to, to quantify the HTC for, for any of their, molding, uh, of, of their molding operations. And this data here was based on some measurements taken back in 1999 by a research group in France. So they've used one data set and they apply that for, for, for all, their, uh, all their simulations. And on the whole, for conventional injection molding, it works pretty well. But we have to look at these values and think, well, are these going to be suitable for micro-injection molding? So basically, we've done, uh, we've done some measurements with, with the thermal camera again. Uh, once again, the top one for reference was us doing, uh, we were using it uh, to monitor hot spots on a, on a brake disc for Bentley. So it's a new uh, Bentley Bentayga. Um, but we've done it um, on, on a range of different, uh, different roughness uh, cavities and some flat sapphire using a high-speed camera as well. And as I said before, if we, if we look at what the outcomes we get from this, we do see this kind of hot flow front at the, uh, at the front of the, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the thermograph. And that is as we'd expect because it's characteristic of this fountain flow effect. As I said earlier, basically what happens when you inject into a mold cavity is the material that hits the, uh, the, the mold surface will, will freeze almost instantaneously, and then the hot molten core is, is kind of convected down the center of that. So basically, as material goes through this frozen layer that's, that's building all the time, it deposits itself on the outside of the mold, which gives us this, this, this kind of hot spot here. And this is a good result because it means that we are confident that this is actually just a surface measurement. We're not looking deeper into the polymer. So we're just seeing, just seeing the surface temperature, so we can use that to monitor the cooling behavior. <coughs> so, uh, this is some work uh, that, that the Max has done working on this, where what we've done is looked at the influence of injection speeds on this surface temperature. And as you would expect, if you run at a faster injection speed, you see a higher surface temperature. So there's two reasons for that. One is it has less time to cool as it goes into the mold and through the mold. Uh, but two, um, there might also be a shear heating effect as well, because we're forcing the material in quite quickly. Internal friction could be generated, which also contributes to this increase in temperature. Likewise, if we look at this uh, surface temperature evolution as we go down uh, the length of the mold, uh, we see this surface temp uh, temperature declines as well. So this is once again caused by this effect that basically we're getting additional cooling of this material being convected through the center of the part. And as it's distributed on the cavity wall, we can actually measure this directly. So we can, we can use it to quantify what's happening. Um, we also looked at, as I said, from, well, I showed from the graph before, the surface roughness is gonna be quite key in terms of this, this kind of, uh, this, this heat flow. So what we did was we've actually machined the sapphire window directly with, with different, uh, different profiles and different roughnesses to try and get an, uh, an indication of how this will influence our heat transfer across this boundary. And initially we saw, uh, we saw quite an interesting result where we get an initial sort of faster rate of cooling for the rougher surface, which is probably because we've got this increased contact area because the, the overall contact area is slightly larger. But then it detached much earlier on than for a flat window. So basically we may have air traps in there, which allows us sort of an earlier detachment during cooling as it shrinks away from that mold surface. And when that happens, we've still got material in the center of the part that is at higher temperature. And so that is actually sort of like uh, is conducted to the surface. So we see this kind of reheating effect as well, which has been documented in, in conventional injection molding too. So the cooling can certainly influence, uh, so the roughness can certainly influence the cooling behavior of the part. So we've actually implemented this in our simulation software. So what we've done is we've, we've, uh, we've built a, a mold flow model. Uh, we've modeled our cavity plates and the, and the main elements of the mold that are gonna be significant for, for thermal, uh, for thermal uh, assessment of, of, of the part. And we've worked through um, using the, the, the mold flow defaults. We've actually adjusted those uh, based on our data to parts that seem more appropriate for microinjection molding. And basically, um, they're not too dissimilar from, from, from the standard default values. But what we do see is uh, a much higher, a much more significant um, uh, heat transfer coefficient for the hold phase of the cycle. Um, now, in, the, um, in conventional injection molding, it's, it's basically it's the, the injection filling phase that seems to dominate in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the heat transfer coefficient. But for micro-injection molding, the hold phase is, is a much more dominant value. And the reason for this is, if we actually look at the nature of micro-injection molding components, even with our Wittmann Battenfeld design, we're reducing the size of the sprue, but our parts in many cases can still form a small percentage of the overall shot size. 
So what that means is, as I said before, um, when I said normally on the injection phase of the cycle, you're filling a cavity to 99% fill and then switching over to hold pressure. Um, if we have a part that is only 1% of the part volume anyway, then we're switching over before the material's actually got here. And we have to do that with, with these small parts because if we switch over as the part is filling, there's no way the machine will respond quickly enough. It will overpressure and you will actually see flash on your part. So for these kinds of products, the whole pressure becomes a, becomes a much more significant phase of your process than it is perhaps for conventional injection molding. So we need to get the heat transfer coefficient right in this, in this phase of the process to get adequate sort of description of this heat flow across the boundary. So if you take one thing from the lecture today, uh, it's, this, it's this concern of switch over and when hold happens in microinjection molding studies. I've read papers where people have actually done uh, DOEs and statistical, statistical analysis and sort of said, well, actually, the injection speed didn't have, to have, didn't have a significant effect on the quality of my part. And that's because it was actually the hold phase that was dominating the filling of their, ca of their cavity anyway. So this is, this is a, an interesting result. So basically, what we can see here is, is uh, if you actually look at a, a typical profile, um, this, this initial phase, if we're using a heat transfer co coefficient, um, the actual cavity, the, 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 the part we're making, might not have even started to fill when this drops down to this, this second default value. So what we're recommending is a much higher uh, hold phase heat transfer coefficient to get the right, uh, the, right, um, the, 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 the quality uh, of, of, of the result. So we've actually verified this. What we did was we looked at our microneedle device. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, one of our early microneedle tools with a, an array of 25 conical microneedles on here. So we built our, our MoFlow model. We tried a number of different sort of mesh densities to see how that influenced the result. And then what we did was we tried different heat transfer coefficient values in our model. So this is our sort of newly derived um, sort of heat transfer coefficient with, that we think is going to be the best value. So what we did was we put that into our simulation. Uh, we modeled, as I said before, the surrounding tool. And we, uh, we looked at the simulation result. And as you might expect, for the higher heat transfer coefficients, things are going to cool more quickly. And so we saw this kind of defect, these shorter shots and poor, poorer quality filled needles uh, with these, with these uh, higher heat transfer coefficient values. So what we did was we actually compared it to, to our molded components. And basically, from the measured needle length, uh, our molded part suggested a value of around about 8,000 8, uh, watts per, per Kelvin meter squared. Uh, which, is, which is in line with, with what we expected. <coughs> so in the last five minutes, um, I'll talk about ultrasonic injection molding, which is the process we're going to do in the, in the workshop shortly. So in ultrasonic injection molding, we don't have a screw at all anymore. So Adrian spent ages telling you about extrusion yesterday, which unfortunately is, is kind of wasted for this particular application because we're moving away from a screw. The way we mount the material is now we use a, a sonitrode. So this is basically a sonitrode from an ultrasonic welder, which is used to join plastics. Um, this vibrates at uh, 30 kilohertz uh, with an amplitude of about 20 microns. And what, so what's happening is this is vibrating exceptionally quickly. Um, and that energy from that vibration is transmitted into the polymer. So it causes, as, as Mert described in, the, uh, in his, his talk on, uh, on, uh, on Monday, um, it's basically, uh, it adds energy to the polymer in two, with two mechanisms. There's a, there's a friction between the particles and an internal heating caused by the viscoelasticity of the material. Um, but this basically causes melting, allows it to flow, so we can then use uh, the piston or the motion of this to, to fill an actual, uh, an actual cavity. So, so this is what's happening inside the machine. We actually have two pistons. We have the sonitrone mounted at the top, which applies the energy, and then we have an injection piston that, that drives from below. So from an initial solid state, we were locally melting the material, we're heating the material, and then the final motion of the piston is pushing it into the cavity. The interesting thing as well, though, is we sustain the ultrasonic energy during, during the injection phase as well. Um, and as we sustain that energy, we do seem to get uh, improvements in the actual filling behavior of the material as well. So if we look at the advantages, First of all, you've got material savings because you only use a number of pellets you require to make one shot. You don't have a screw filled with material that you've got to kind of throw away at the end of your manufacturing process or, or, or you don't need to purge that screw out at the start of your process with a different material. Um, it's very easy to clean. Max did this really nice experiment where he, he made one part out of a carbon black filled polypropylene and then on the next shot did it with a, with a virgin material and there's basically no contamination between, between the two material sets. So basically, uh, you, you don't really need a cleaning requirement. 
which is really important if we're looking at things like medical components or, or things containing pharmaceutical ingredients. We, can, we know that we've got a, a, very, uh, a very sort of safe route for, for processing using those. Uh, the energy savings are good because we've got no thermoelectric heaters. We've not got a lot of energy in that barrel and in the extruder of, of the machine. Um, and as I said before, if we sustain this, this ultrasonic energy during filling, we seem to get a kind of low, well, well it requires lower pressures to fill equivalent micromolding cavities, um, or we're, we're causing a viscosity reduction by the, applying this energy. Um, this means that we can generate lower internal stresses, which is useful for optical components, uh, and, uh, and overall a low residence time. If we're making very, it's been designed to handle conventional feedstocks, so we can put conventional polymer pellets in here, which means that the volume of this screw is probably about six grams of material. Now, if we're only making a part that's just a, a few milligrams, then the material is going to spend quite a long time in that screw at temperature. So basically, materials can degrade or they can start to, they can start to change chemically. Um, so so by, by just using the number of pellets we want per shot, uh, we only heat it, we heat it pretty much instantaneously and then convect it into the cavity. We're reducing this residence time at temperature. But we wanted to do some work to compare this with our conventional injection molding technique. So we created a tool that could work on both our machines. And we just used the same imaging stuff that, that I showed before. So we're now using the, uh, the infrared camera again. Um, this is the, the cycle in action. So this is our old infrared camera. We've now replaced this with a, with a, a better one that you'll be using today. Um, so we can image the, the cavity filling directly using our infrared camera. And from that, we can infer what's happening in the process. <laughs> um, now, one of, the, one of the interesting things with, uh, with ultrasound is, I, sh I showed you before, with conventional injection molding, the hottest uh, surface temperature is just behind the injection flow front. But because we sustain the energy later in the ultrasonic process, we actually see the highest temperatures after filling. So we actually see the highest temperatures uh, coincident with the highest pressures in the cavity. So this could be really useful for microfeature replication and also minimizing stresses in the cavity as well. Um, it, 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 it behaves completely differently to conventional injection molding. So as you can see here, these are traces from, from a few different samples. So this is the, the, the peak temperature uh, just behind the flow front, but then this is the, 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 the peak surface temperature for the process as a whole. So this is happening some time afterwards for these materials. And what this allows us to do, because we've got that pressure in after that initial sort of like stressful filling uh, stage of the process, we give the material time to relax. So these molecular chains can kind of uh, unwind a little bit, um, de-stress, and so what that's going to do is that's going to give us benefits in terms of the stress-induced birefringence in the material, okay? So this is just uh, two samples and the cross polarizers which allows us to view the internal stresses directly using birefringence. And we can see for the ultrasonic parts, we do see a lower overall level of stress, but it does look a little bit discontinuous. We've got a few, uh, a few sort of like um, gels or, or problems in there as well. So we did uh, some tests using a tensile test bar and comparing them on the uh, ultrasound injection molding machine and the Whitman Battenfeld machine. So this is our tensile test bar here, and this is the one that you'll use this morning. Um, and what we noticed was um, generally uh, for the ultrasound, uh, in, uh, ultrasound molding process, we generally sustained surface temperatures um, a little bit longer than we did for conventional injection molding, as we saw with the previous example. So we, we, we're getting heater heat in later in the process, which should give the material more time to relax and or uh, crystallize. <coughs> so what we did was we decided to sort of benchmark the outcomes from each using a range of different physical characterization techniques. So we measured the, uh, the surface roughness of the parts, and we found that for the ultrasonic molding, we actually had uh, improved surface roughness for many of these parts. And we think that's simply because um, because of this extra temperature at the surface, it was able to conform more to the sapphire window and create an overall flatter, uh, flatter surface when compared to the conventional injection molding. We also looked at, I won't go into this uh, too much because you're gonna do crystallinity tomorrow, but we did some DSC measurements to measure the overall level of crystallinity in the parts. And it looks like the ultrasound uh, crystallinity levels were higher than conventional injection molding as well. Once again, because we can sustain this temperature in there for longer to give it more time to crystallize basically. Uh, once again, you're going to learn what sax wax is, but basically what the data shows here as well is that on average a slightly higher crystallinity in the ultrasonic generated materials. But the crucial one is obviously the, the, the physical properties. We need to make sure the ultrasound is a, is a, is a reasonable candidate for, doing, uh, for making structural parts, mechanical parts. Um, 
for the conventional microinjection model, we've got very, very consistent components, as we'd expect with the Bitman Battenfeld machine. So all these samples failed within about 10% in terms of the strain, and we got very, very good um, repeatability of performance. Less so with the ultrasonic machine, just because of the, the, the way uh, particles are fed into the machine, so we didn't get the same level of, of repeatability. Um, and this is simply because we're not able to control our dosing as accurately as conventional injection molding. In the ultrasonic machine, we count pellets that go in there, but the pellets can be any size, so we're not quite sure exactly what the mass of the material that we have in there is. And so that exhibits itself in the molding quality as slight variations in molding. Um, but even so, despite that, we actually got mechanical behavior that was very, very close uh, to, to the conventional injection molding. So we know it's a viable technique for production of, of real components. Okay, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. I think that was a, about an hour. Uh, do we have any, any questions from the floor? Yes. 44, yes. Right, okay, so basically we've got two cooling curves here. We did two experiments. One was on a flat sapphire window, which is a very, very uh, high surface quality. So that's probably, uh, if you're talking RA, uh, maybe about two nanometers or something like that. But then what we did was, um, for one of those, we actually machined it with a kind of one micron um, surface roughness texture on there. And then we imaged that with the uh, infrared camera to look at the influence on the cooling behavior between the two surfaces. So when we looked at the cooling profiles, which is what we have here, so this is a, this is a temperature plot showing that surface, surface temperature results, we noticed that because uh, we got this, this sort of difference in the gradient between these two, two curves, the rougher surface was cooling quicker initially because you've got this greater contact area. So you imagine you've got a rough surface, if that was a piece of string you stretch it out, it would be longer than just a flat piece of string, so you've got a higher contact area between the two materials. So you maybe expect that higher initial cooling. But then we have this, this, this kind of, uh, this point here, where as the part, in, in any injection molding process, there will be a point where the material shrinks to such an extent, it actually comes away from the surface of the mold. And as soon as you've lost that, that contact, you no longer have conduction going, going from one material to the other. So you see this, this, this continuity that we see there. Now, now you've, you've come away from the mold surface, but remember that even though this is the kind of frozen part of the mold tool, Inside the part, you've still got this kind of much hotter core region because the cooling has happened from the outside in, basically. So now you've got this hotter core region, but you've no longer got the conduction into the tool surface. That temperature actually sort of moves through the thickness and hits this, this exposed surface now, which is what we're looking at with the camera, and it's causing this reheating effect. It's not really a reheating as such, it's more that the component itself is balancing its temperature. So the temperature is trying to reach equilibrium. But because you had this initial phase where the core was at higher temperature and the surface was at a lower temperature, we see that as this kind of effect of a repeating of the surface on the profile there, basically. And uh, is there any place possible to uh, prevent creation of a welding like with uh, pre by preheating of dye? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, that's, that, that, that's one of the things. I mean, basically, what you want to do is give the material more time for the molecules to diffuse across that newly created boundary. So the ways you could do it are increasing your injection speed, so you're giving that flow for sort of less time to, to cool, as it were, as it flows through the tool. Increase the tool temperature is obviously a great way to do it, but you can only go so far with that because you're then directly influencing the cycle time of the machine because it's going to take longer for, the, for, the, for the, the, the material to cool down so you can eject it from, from the part as well. Yeah. Uh, another thing that people do as well is uh, variable temperature molding. So basically what they do is they increase the tool temperature really high during injection and then they, they, they cool it rapidly once the, once the molding is complete. And that's the process used for, um, I've got a very good example there, things like high gloss television surrounds. You know with almost like a piano black sort of mirror type finish? High temperature molding is used for that because that also removes this visible weld line on the frame of the, on the, frame of the TV surround. Because the surround goes 
a TV surround is a quite a nice example because it's like a picture frame and there's no way of avoiding a weld line on that because you're going to inject from certain locations. And so that's why they use this elevated temperature molding to try and remove that, that visible uh, indicator of the weld line. I have a question concerning the lifetime of the screw and the mold. Yeah. I, of course, like for depends of the material you're injecting, the material like design of the mold and mm -hmm. so on. But concerning like microinjection molding, I think like the lifetime of the mold is much less than a traditional injection molding, right? Because you're concerned about the size of the product, the roughness, and so on. Yeah, um, on average, I would say that's a, that's a fair assumption. I mean, typical typical conventional injection molding uh, with a with a hardened uh, hardened tool, you'd be looking at sort of maybe a million, maybe more than a million sort of cycles or something like that. With micro injection molding, it's an interesting one because um, uh, we're working with the same materials and. Uh, and non-fiber film materials, so the same mold materials and non-fiber film materials, we, we, we might get close to that actually with, with, with some of the simpler parts. But as soon as you go to microstructures and nanostructures and that kind of thing, then any kind of wearing of those structures is going to be much more significant. So, so it depends entirely on the kind of geometries, geometries you're talking about. Uh, you, you also have higher injection pressures, and it can be an issue as well if we're, we would tend to mold with higher uh, mold temperatures now because of conventional injection mold as well, which might have a detrimental effect on the lifetime of the tool. And the reason why is, once again, we're not really waiting to uh, cool things so much. So in conventional injection molding, everyone tries to keep the tool temperature as low as possible while still hitting the quality targets, because that way you can make more, more parts per hour, your productivity increases, and so do your profit. Uh, with micro-injection molding, there's less pressure uh, from that side of things. There's more required things to be right, and the quality has to be absolutely small. So we generally work with slightly higher tool temperatures. Uh, but also sometimes by necessity we're working with softer materials for micro-injection molds as well. So if we're doing things like diamond turning, it's very difficult to do that with sort of hard sort of carbon steel. So we might be using uh, some amorphous metals, uh, certainly nanostructures, so we might be using nickel shin and that kind of thing, which would last nowhere near as long as, uh, as, long as uh, a hard steel surface. So it is a problem. But we're also looking for new ways around that as well. So whether we can actually um, coat and pattern tool surfaces, and then after a certain uh, period, remove that coating, coat it again, and repattern to sustain the lifetime of the tool. What's the thoughts on those questions? I have two other questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, for metal injection molding and ceramic injection molding, mm -hmm. the design of the screw is much different, like for like for share. Um, yeah, they tend to be lower lower compression screws. So they're more a kind of screw. Uh, we also, I mean, one of the nice things about the Bitman Batman machine as well is because we don't have this check ring, we can be a little bit more flexible mm -hmm. in our screw designs. So we have things like mixing elements by so we can incorporate those in the screw design as well. So, so yeah, we can be quite flexible there. So we can use the device screw for, for, uh, for the power drill materials. Because as I say, normally lower compression ratio so we don't shear the material uh, quite as, as much as a uh, standard then plastic mm -hmm. screw. So we don't want to cause it. Sometimes they can be very shear sensitive with those, with those initial feed stocks. So and we we'll care basically. The, the last question was yeah, yeah. is do you have here the coin traction machines? Um, we have one large one. Um, it's a little bit longer than two. But uh, no, generally for, for the micro injection stuff we'll generally do a sequential sort of molds parts on one machine yeah, and yeah. those into the next one basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that we, we, we haven't done a great deal on, on co-injection um, simply because it's uh, with having two injection model machines we can transfer between the two and a single co-injection is quite a big points. investment for, for a research group when we haven't had significant interest to, to be able to work with that basically. Uh, but it's an interesting idea. But we have done things like that. We also, as we did mention, we do things like synthetic rubbers, so the reactive processes as well where we can effectively have a cool uh, barrel, an injection system, and a very hot barrel, so again, causing uh, cure through the bottom as well, which, which has been really successful. Yep. Um, is there too much, <coughs> sir, is there too much difference between cooling at the sapphire window and tool surface of steel? Good question. Poly -poly very good question. No, they're actually, um, I'd like to say we did this by design, but it was a bit serendipitous that when you look at the thermal properties of sapphire, it's very
very, very close to the E20 tool skill. So thermal conductivity is, uh, is pretty much the same. Peak capacity is slightly different, but it's still the same order of magnitude. I think one is about 1.5 times. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's still a representative, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's the equivalent of looking through steel at the surface of the steel to, to a certain extent. It's not going to make a massive difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how can we find the optimum number of cavities per die? Uh, the optimum number of cavities per die is one. <laughs> for, yeah. for ensuring quality. Uh, how far you go from there, it, 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 becomes, it becomes a kind of uh, financial decision, basically. I mean, um, in micro-injection molding, we generally don't stray above four cavities, which are some of the smaller parts, <coughs> I think that's probably the, the, the safest. Uh, it's just... If it, if it becomes such a demand on the tool maker for things like runner balancing, if you've got gate dimensions that are the order of, sort of um, hundreds of, 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 of microns in diameter to sustain the, 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 the quality and the tolerance of that for every gate on the, uh, on the system becomes, becomes a challenge. So, yeah, uh, for, for the three micro welding class, four is, is the, the, the largest level of application we've got. And a lot of the times, because for micro injection welding, the cycle time is so much lower. Than, uh, than the convention injection molding anyway. I mean, on the, we can make parts, we can make four parts every three seconds, and we've got two mold tools as well to do that. So when you actually look at the output, you don't really demand 32, 64 cavity tools for a lot of the applications. And also, quite a lot of the market isn't massive volumes, it'd be like tens of thousands of parts, but really high added value components as well. So it's, uh, we haven't really seen a requirement for, for huge amount of cavitation. Uh, it also, I mean, it, 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 yeah, you, you could actually end up using a lot more material as well, because of the feed system required to get to the, uh, to the parts. To, you know, to make the parts. Yeah. Okay. Right. Any more questions? Very good. Let's go and play with some machines then.